All right, all right, it's time to get started. You glad to be here? Some of you, I tell you what, I was listening to choir, I heard the choir, I was getting a little bit rowdy back here. I tell you what I'm going to do with them, and we've got to keep them until the next choir gets here, okay? And uh, I was thinking about Thanksgiving, Miss Baker and I went up to the mountains for a few days, went up there, and what's that mountain we was going up to see? Mount Mitchell, we was going to Mount Mitchell. Okay, got got close, but they closed the road on us. So our Thanksgiving dinner was on a little ledge there overlooking the mountains. Was a were two uh, turkey and lettuce tomato sandwiches with mayonnaise, and uh, a glass of Diet Coke or Pepsi with uh, half of it was melted ice. And that was our Thanksgiving dinner. And boy, was it good. We had some chips, too. It was nice. And some, and some brownies. <laughs> I, I just, you know, you meet people. And we was eating, and a couple come by. And I said, how you doing? Fine. I said, would y'all like a brownie? No. <laughs> I thought, man, why'd it be rude? All from a brownie. And they said, no. Nobody wanted a brownie. My wife said, are you crazy? Who's going to take a brownie from some stranger? <laughs> and I said, well, I understand now, but uh, and I even I said they're homemade. They just kept on walking, yeah. like Sherry and I. Well, Sherry, she left. She didn't. My wife just let me go like a fool of myself. But but we had a great time. Got up there and got back. Didn't run. Didn't have a wreck or nothing. We ran a few folks off the road, but we did real good. <laughs> All right, number four hundred and ninety nine. Uh, bringing in the sheaves. That's talking about harvesting, winning souls to Christ. Bringing in the sheaves. We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing that song, 499. Let's pray, okay? Our Heavenly Father, we are here again this evening. Thank you so much for the wonderful day we've had at our homes in different places. It's good to have such a good crowd back in church again tonight. And I pray, Lord, as we gather here to worship you in spirit and in truth, God, that you will manifest yourself and we'll see you in all that we sing and preach tonight. May you get honor and glory in it. Lord, may we get some help that we need to be a better child of God. Bless the service in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's all stand and sing. Turn over a few pages to 516, 516. We'll sing the first, second, and last of our marching to Zion. Amen. First, second, and last. Everybody's singing now. Everybody's singing. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join. Beautiful, beautiful 
marching we're supposed to be marching anyway headed to heaven that's Zion that's Zion's our place in heaven and so we're it's upward aren't you glad we're going upward one day I used to be headed downward down to hell I was headed to hell but thank God Jesus came away and uh heard the gospel got gloriously saved now I'm headed upward Jesus came down so we could go up how about that Oh, boy, what a wonderful Savior he really, really is. All right, well, just to remind you once again, some things coming up, ladies. This Saturday at 11 o'clock, the Ornament Exchange Lunch and Brunch. And this is for all the ladies. If you don't want to participate in the Ornament Exchange, we want you, they want you to come, enjoy, enjoy the meal, enjoy the fellowship. You don't have to participate in anything. Just come and be a part of uh, the activity. So we want to make that known to you. So it's, it'll be a chance for you to invite somebody to Miss Baker has got a couple ladies she's going to go get that, that, uh, they just like coming. And, uh, so I hope that you'll be inviting some folks. But if you do that, you need to let, need to let, let Ruth and them know that you're going to do that. You're responsible, uh, for that. Okay. And then later over in December, the, on the Thursday, on the, the 13th of December, our Christmas supper at seven o'clock. And, uh, those who want to participate, we're going to have an ugly sweater contest. Amen. And uh, I've got a couple that need nothing done to it. It's just flat ugly. And uh, But we're going to try to fix one up. It'll be a good time. Amen. And you'll get to enjoy. We'll have some games and activities, maybe a skit. And uh, you'll enjoy. You, it's, uh, our, our Christmas supper is always a big highlight. And I hope you'll be for that. Okay. Uh, but anyway, other things are in there. Uh, I, I mentioned this morning about some of our members who are shut-ins, uh, especially this time of the year. I know they'd appreciate a visit if you can go by and see them or uh, uh, a card in the mail. Now, those in the nursing home, you can go by about any time and see them. But those others who are at home, I would, if you're going to go, you call, make sure they'll be home. Some of them still have to go to the doctor and stuff like that. So anyway, if you'll do that, I know they'd appreciate it. All right, I think that's everything that I wanted to share with you. Let's have the choir to sing a couple of songs, okay?
wonderful? You ought to amen the choir. I'll tell you what. Amen. some special singing if I can find Denny he's supposed to sing one tonight a uh, new one he's not here where'd he go he's coming all right okay there he is huh what'd he say getting the butterflies out okay come on make your way up here I asked him I said what's his singing he said I don't know I said I hope it ain't no country western song you don't know any of them how many of you remember Brother Ted Wyndham? You remember Brother Ted? He's in heaven now. He pastored up in Darlington, South Carolina, Victory Baptist Church. And they were having revival. And, uh, and there was a family church that had twin boys. And uh, the daddy drove, uh, was a truck driver. He was gone most, most during the week. He wasn't going to be there in a revival. So they come up and said, Brother Preacher, can we want to sing that. We want to dedicate a song to our daddy who couldn't be here. He said, okay, boys, I'll let y'all do that. He didn't ask him what it was. That's not good. <laughs> so <laughs> they got up there, got the microphones, and they, I don't know the words, it's songs entitled, It Takes 40 Acres to Turn This Rig Around. <laughs> Sang every verse of it, too. I said, Tell you what happened? He said, Man, they got a bunch of amens. <laughs> You're not going to sing It Takes 40 Acres to Turn This Rig Around, are you? You don't even know that one either. <laughs> Come on, Brother Denny. I trust you, my friend. God bless you. Thanks, sir. Uh, actually, I'd never even heard of this song until Ms. Vani asked me to sing it a while back, so I had to figure out what the song was and how to sing it. Um, Y'all know that song about the mansion over the hilltop? Well, this ain't it. <laughs> um, but what it's got in common with that is that uh, this was sung as both a religious and a secular song because the secular people just thought it was like a love song or something and because they didn't get that this is actually talking about walking with the Holy Spirit. They couldn't expect them to get that. So I'll do with it what I can do. <clears throat> when you walk through a storm, keep your head up high, and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm is a golden sky. 
and the sweet silver song of a Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and Walk on, walk on, with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. You'll never walk alone. So walk on through that wind, walk on through that rain, though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on with him in your heart, and you'll never That's great, isn't it? And that's a great spiritual truth there, too, about the Holy Spirit. You'll never walk alone. So let's walk on. One breath, one day at a time. My message this morning, it was really difficult. Lord, help me. And I'm going to continue that thought next Sunday. We're not through with that thought yet about uh, uh, only the lonely. We're going to deal with another, a deeper aspect of that next Sunday, Lord willing. And so I'm glad that song would apply to that. When your heart's been broken, when you're just in such despair and heartache, what do you do? And it's easy to say, keep going. It's easy to say, strive on. That's the people who are telling you that until it happens to them. And uh, so it's not as easy as it seems to be. Some, but it can, it can become renewed. And you can keep going. I'll give me an example. Uh, about... I don't know, I'd say four or five months ago, I was talking with uh, uh, a gentleman who doesn't, just doesn't go here, doesn't go to our church, and he had had some great, uh, uh, just, he said, Brother Baker, if I had time to, because I asked him, I said, how's things going in your life? I hadn't talked to him long. He said, well, Brother Baker, I, you know, I don't tell you no pity, pity party, but I'm telling you what, he said, everything in my life is about to fell apart. He said, I'm at my rope's end. I said, well, I said, uh, I haven't been there, but I do know this. There is a God that can help you if you trust him. And you're still young, and you still got a lot of good years left. So don't waste them. Look to the Lord to give you some help. Amen. All right. I think we got the ladies are going to sing now. Ladies, you come up here and, and, and sing. And uh, we uh, need to give his ladies a name. I don't know what we can name them. But we need to name them something. they singing, singing really good. Okay. And uh, now y'all y'all got some good good songs now. Y'all not singing no truck driving songs on you. Okay. Okay. First, second. First, second, fourth. Leaving out the third. Okay, leaving out the third. It's the first, second. I like these sweet ladies. I would call them the, the four roses. <laughs> Where the dearest 
Yes, sir. A cousin in Oregon. Uh huh. Uh, your cousin's wife, she was at the computer and just passed away right there. Yeah. Wow. Grew up out in Oregon. Well, Tommy, if you write his name down, we'll be pray for that family and give it to me, and we should be praying for that family. Well, I tell you what, death is no respecter of persons. You know that, right. yes, sir. Brother James. Oh my, yeah. Well, maybe most of you know Brother Sammy, great evangelist. Of, doesn't get, he doesn't, he's, he's getting old you now, getting up in years. His memory goes and comes. His wife. Is now not doing well. Well, I tell you what, this, you know, we, <laughs> I remember back when I first started preaching, I, I met Brother Sammy, and he, I got him signed my Bible, and he's still one of my one of my heroes. Every time we had him scheduled to preach here, he'd call me up. I had him scheduled to preach three or four times. He'd call me up, Brother Baker, it's Brother Sammy. Yeah, Brother Sammy. He said, listen, I'm over here in such such a place, and boy, the Lord's moving this meeting. And they want to go another week. But I'm supposed to be with you. And I'll come if you want me to. But I feel like Lord had me here. And I've got a guy I can send you that can preach real good too. And just whatever you want to do. And I said, well, Brother Sammy, if, if a revival is breaking out over there, you need to stay and send us your substitute. Well, every man he sent did a jam up job. I mean, really, we had great meetings. And so uh, I, I could tell some stories about Sammy. Oh, my soul. And uh, he and my wife, oh, my soul. She said, I'm not going to hear him preach again. I'm not going. I said, why? She said, you know what he does. We went and uh, he was preaching. He was preaching on how ladies, ladies ought to dress. Oh, boy. We sat in there and he said, Miss Baker, Sister Baker, stand up. She said, stand up. So she, she said, he said, look at that. That's how you're supposed to dress. <laughs> she said, I ain't never going back again. <laughs> so anyway. And, uh, but anyway, we went, we went back about a year and a half later. She did. <laughs> she said, I'll go if I can sit toward the back in the middle of a pew. I said, okay. So we go and sit toward the back. I like sitting in the back. In the middle of a pew, and sure enough, he did it again. <laughs> he said, she said, I ain't doing it. Oh, Brother Sammy, it ain't one like him. And a great, great man of God. And uh, so anyway, uh, he's getting up in years, but he's got a young man over there now that uh, has come in and sort of uh, falling right in Sammy's shadow, you might say, going to be there when... He passes on. That's good, isn't it? And so I'm thankful for that. All right, tonight's uh, love offering is going to go to a family on your list there, the Priester family. And uh, they're, they both have a little, little income coming in. And uh, we want to receive tonight's others offering for them. And uh, they have a lot of medical uh, problems. Oh, boy, I'm telling you. And over the years that they've been that way, we've tried to help them out and do things for them. And uh, I'll be going to see them, I think, Thursday. And we'll carry them a set of the revival tapes. Y'all can get me a set of those revival tapes for them and 
recent messages here. And uh, they had a little itty bitty television and it wouldn't have worked. So we bought them a new television so they could watch the services here. And so we're going to uh, receive tonight's others offering for the priesters. So I hope we'll get a great offering for them. Okay, we're going to stand up and sing the first and last verse of a good song. Amen. All right, let's all stand once again. Turn to page 529, 529. We'll sing the first and last of how firm a foundation. Amen. Let's all stand. <clears throat> pray and ask God to bless the offering, ask God to bless the priest or family, and we can be a big help to them. Amen. All right, Lord Jesus, once again tonight, we take the time to uh, be a blessing to someone. And Lord, the priest or family, uh, Lord, some difficult, had some difficult years lately, these last few years they've had, a lot, a lot of difficult problems, God. So we want to be a little help to them. Here it is, Christmas coming, and uh, their income is so limited, God, so help it to be a good offering tonight. Meet some needs they may have. In thy name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Amen. That's a blessing there, isn't it? Real, real blessing. Let's get our Bibles out tonight. <clears throat> going to turn to a very familiar passage of Scripture. Going to use it for our starting place out of the book of Malachi, uh, the last chapter. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, the third chapter, not the last chapter, the third chapter. And uh, as you turn there, I, I trust that uh, uh, we'll all pay attention tonight. It's a very, every message is important. None of them is unimportant. And, but I hope this will help, help you to understand some things tonight about, uh, about what God would have us to do. Malachi chapter 3, it says uh, in verse number, the latter part of verse number 7, Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Well, they ask a question, so God asks a question. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Now watch this. That there may be meat in mine house. Now notice this statement. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, God is saying, put me to the test. Prove me. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, pour uh, you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. You got that? God is saying here, you've robbed me and of your tithes and offerings, and, uh, but I want you to know if you'll bring your tithes and offerings and just obey me in that, here's what I'm going to do. If you'll prove me, I, uh, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So God is saying here, if you'll quit robbing me, if you'll do just the opposite, if you will give me, honor me with the tithes and offerings, I will, I will take and open up the windows of heaven and I will give you so much that you'll not be able to handle it all. Now, is that a good deal? Is that a good deal? Amen? Now, he said, prove me. Now, I don't know tonight how many of you have put God to the test. Have you? I have. I found that verse to be true. I found out that God means what he says. I found out that God says, if you will honor me with your tithes and offerings, I will bless you beyond measure. And God has done that in my life. Now, uh, some people have the idea that, that uh, if, you, if you give God $10, he's going to give you 100 back. I, I would never say that because I don't know that. I just know what he said. He said, if you'll prove me, I will give you back more than you thought you, more than you think. In other words, it'd be on, beyond your measure. You see, God's measure is a whole lot bigger than our measure. Sort of reminds me of the story. I think I told you this some, uh, some months ago. Uh, father and his little boy went to town back in, Olden days, they say, went to town at a general store and uh, went in the little general store there and got some supplies. And the a guy who owned the store said, son, won't you go ahead and just get your handful of candy out of that jar? The boy just stood there and looked at it, looked at it. And the guy said, son, go ahead and get your handful. Get your handful. The little boy just kept looking at it, looking at the jar. And finally, the fellow said, well, so the owner reached in there and got a big handful and, and pulled it out and put it in a bag and gave it to him. He got outside and was headed home, and his daddy said, Son, why were you so rude to that man? He told you to get your get a handful. You just looked at him, uh, and, and, and what's wrong with you, boy? He said, Daddy, his hand's bigger than mine. <laughs> now, that's the way God is. You know, God's got a big hand. Amen? I'm telling you, uh, he's proven in my life, he has proven to me that he will keep his word when it comes to that right there. But I want to preach tonight on this thought, will a man rob God? I gave that little talk last Sunday. I won't repeat that again about robbing, uh, robbing God. But I hope tonight, I'm not, I'm not preaching to anybody here. I hope not that you have, 
you have robbed God. You have taken and you have, you have spiritually put a gun to God's head. You have robbed God and you've said, I, I won't, I won't from you. We're going to look at that. In other words, millions of people. You see, God is our provider. And uh, when, I, when Mrs. Baker and I, we had three kids growing up. We were their provider. We provided for our children. We, we wanted to make sure they had clothes on their back and food to eat, and a, a, a bed to lay on, a roof over their head. We, wanted, we were their provider. And so you, you, surely you would not want to do anything that would hinder your provider from providing for you. And every week, millions and millions of people they rob God. So millions of people, they rob God of that due, that, the, that portion that belongs to him. Now I understand that you and I are saved and that everything that we have, everything that we so-called possess belongs to him. Do you understand you own nothing? Now you may have you may have a lot of money in the bank. You may have a, a lot of land that you, that's you, in your name and you may have a lot of stuff. But if you're a child of God, none of it belongs to you. Absolutely none of it. Your shoes don't belong to you. Your, your clothes don't belong to you. I mean, everything, every possession you have belongs to God. You agree with that? Millions of people are robbers with God in their money. In other words, you take from God that which belongs to him. You know, the, and why do people do that? I'm going to tell you why. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. And I don't know this. I'm just speculating this. I would believe that probably over the many years I've been here, we have probably had folks who came here and enjoy our enjoy the church here, but they trickled out because they're stingy. They just don't want that. This stuff about really giving ten percent and then an offering and then supporting missionaries. And I can imagine we probably lost. In that didn't want to participate. They thought, well, you know, uh, in other words, and they don't want to hear about it. They think, boy, if I can just drop a few dollars in the offering plate uh, and scratch myself on the back and pat myself on the head, I've done a good deed. But that won't work out. It won't work with God. No sir, it won't. Is it dead? Who's why is it dead? Chris is pointing at Dylan. Right. Dylan. Salary. We'll use this microphone right here, fellas. Now I got to start all over again. You don't want that, do you? Okay. All right. Can you hear me okay? Oh, hear me. Hear me okay. All right. I feel like a television preacher now. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. But anyway, uh, the love of money is root of all evil. You'd be surprised how many people. They, and, and they'll, now listen, they'll give uh, if, if they have the idea, well, if, if a preacher can convince them, if, you know, I'm praying for the first 100, the first 100 who give their $1,000, I'm going to pray that God would, would do this for you. And folks will send $1,000 in, thinking that, God, that, that they're going to get back. And all the thing they're doing is helping that millionaire become more millionaire. And they never get back what that fellow said. Now, I don't believe in that kind of giving. I believe that you are to give your tithes and offers through your local church. I believe you want to support missionaries through your church. Now, if you want to help out an evangelist somewhere, I'll be a blessing to somebody, a minister, a particular ministry uh, that is godly and honorable, uh, that's okay. But I think the safest thing you can do in your giving is give to your local church. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. And so uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. And uh uh, uh, little or much, listen, money can rule you or it can ruin you. Your money can run your life or you can run your money. The point I'm trying to make is here, God said you've robbed me of tithes and offerings and because of that I'm going to curse you with the curse. I'm not going to bless you. I sure want God's blessings. I don't want God's cursing. And uh, oh, I, I believe in all my heart, we have, seen a, we have seen a lot of people over the years quit going to church because that uh, of the giving part. Now I realize, I, I realize sometimes there are, there, I don't go to other churches that I don't know, but uh, somebody said, well, with that church, all that preacher wants is money, money, money. Every time I go, I want money, 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 money. And uh, I got news for you. Uh, you. It takes money to pay the power bill. 
Amen. It takes money to do things. But uh, I thought about this. What are you investing your money in? You see, what are you investing? I mean, it, it, since, since uh, you're not, the Bible says we're bought with a price. We're not our own. We belong to him. Just what are you investing your money in? Now, God expects us, God expects us to make sure that whatever money we have, whatever possession we have, that we do not hoard it up, but we make sure that we use it and we make sure that we can, we can pass something on to the poor and the needy and we can pass something on to our children. What are you leaving your children? Huh? Somebody says, got a bumper sticker says, I'm, I'm burning my children, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, spending my children's inheritance. Yeah, and they are too. Throwing it away. Brother Baker, what are you leaving your children? They go, I'm not leaving them nothing. I don't have much to leave them. I already told them when I, when, whenever I get old and feeble, I want to, we're going to go from house to house and live with each one of them. And we expect them to take good care of us, you know, bathe us and feed us and comb our hair and, and, and all that kind of stuff. They said, we ain't doing that, Daddy. But where are you investing your money in? Where are you putting your money? How much money do you throw away every week, every day? You'd be surprised how much money is wasted by God's people. Money that can be spent. Mm. Wow, for the glory of God. You know, see, God loveth a cheerful giver. Some of you have never met the priesters, have you? Never met them. Good family, good couple. A brother priest used to teach Sunday school. He was a Sunday school teacher at one time. I mean, just a tremendous man of the word. And now he can hardly walk. And she also. And if they do go, usually if they go somewhere, they have to go to the doctor. While they're going to the doctor, they stop by the grocery store or something. I want to tell you that what you do with the money you have that God puts in your hands is very important. Invest in heavenly things. Invest in missions. Invest in people. And, 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 and let, God, let God direct you on how to spend the money that he puts in your hands. The more you invest in the things of, 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 of spiritual things, the more God will bless you. Amen? Oh, yes. All right, so uh, people rob God. Another thing that people rob, you can rob God of his service. You can rob God of his service. Take your Bible and turn over the book of Ephesians, if you would. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8, I believe it is. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2 and uh, uh, verse number 8. Look, listen to these verses. Ephesians 2, 8. That's what it says. For by grace are you what? Saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Isn't that a wonderful two verses? Amen. Now watch verse 10. For we are his what? Workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. Which God hath before ordained, now listen, that we should what? Walk in them. Wow. So, the Bible's saying here that God didn't save you. We are his workmanship. God didn't save anybody just to sit in church. He didn't save anybody just to, just to look around and say, boy, things are bad. God's, God saves every little boy and girl, every teenager, every mom and dad, everybody who gets saved, gets saved with a, with, with a service in mind. And when, and when a child of God is not serving God, you're robbing God of your service for him. I, I, I think I did this uh, percentage-wise about a tithe. I think a, a, a tenth of our time of a week is about 17 hours a week. In other words, if we go by the tithe of our time and serving God, and you say, well, I'm in Sunday school, I'm in preaching, so that's uh, three hours on Sunday, and then an hour on Wednesday night, that's four hours. What about the other 12 hours? Well, you say, I pray an hour a day. <laughs> well, that's seven. Well, I'm pointing, I'm trying, and that's just, that's just praying. So God expects us to serve. God, listen, God saved you to serve him. You're not your own. You pay. You bought with a price. Paul said he was a, he was a, a, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a bond servant. 
And so Paul said, I no longer belong to myself. A matter of fact, Paul said, everything I do, I strive to please him. And we have the idea that Paul was the exception. Paul was, well, you know, Paul was a great apostle. Paul was a saved man and no more saved than you and I. And you look at the life of Paul. Paul had people all over that, all over that region, uh, 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 women and men and, and young folks who, who assisted Paul and Paul's journeys and helping him and helping each other in churches. Read the, read, read the Pauline epistles and understand that Paul had help from all kinds of people serving God and helping him. And so God expects you to be a service. God expects you to do something with your Christian life. He said, well, I sing in the choir. That's wonderful. That's a good service. But it's more than that. You see, it's outside the church walls that we're lacking. It's outside the church property where we need to get busy. Well, that track rack ought to be emptied out every about at least once a month with just people handing out tracks. I mean, you are to each week, each week, talk to somebody about the Lord. You are to at least each week invite somebody to church. You ought to at least once a week uh, have somebody burden on your heart that needs to be saved. If you don't, you're robbing God of your service. You see, you owe him that. I owe him that. Not because I'm a preacher, but because I'm a Christian. And so every, listen, every part of your body belongs to him. Every part. This hand doesn't belong to me. Your hand doesn't belong to you. This mouth is not mine, it belongs to him. These feet are not my feet, they're his feet. Hey, listen, uh, even, even the inward man, my, the inward man, the spiritual man, everything, your inward being belongs to him. You know why most people don't serve God? It's because the inward part is not right. The spiritual part's not right. They don't seek the will of God. They don't read their Bible. They don't study. They think, well, you know, I, I, can't, I can't go out and visit anybody. I don't know how to knock on a door. I don't know how to do this. But you know, folks do a lot of things they said they can't do. Huh? <laughs> I mentioned how we were up there in the, in the mountains and Miss Baker had a bag of brownies and I just being friendly to people. Want a brownie? Nobody wanted a brownie. <laughs> Well, then I got in the car and got to thinking, you know, well, my wife might be right. She said, would you take a brownie just from anybody, a total stranger? I said, probably not. She said, duh. But if I'm willing to offer somebody a brownie, can I offer somebody a track? Huh? You'll be surprised how many people you meet every week that would that would love to hear you say, you go to church anywhere? Yes, I do. Where you go? I go, well, that's good. I'm glad you're going to church. I'm just asking because if you didn't, I was going to invite you out to our church. When did you become a Christian? Well, and you're not trying to put them on the spot. Well, here, I'm going to give you a track if you're not saved. This will tell you how, you how you can know you can be saved, how you can go to heaven when you die. And they can either take it or reject it. You ever tried that? Give God, serve the Lord. Your feet belong to him. You don't belong to yourself. These hands don't belong to me. These ears don't belong to me. These eyes don't belong to me. I mean, everything about you, inward and outward, belongs to him. You're bought with the price. And when you don't serve God, you're robbing him of that service. Number three, you rob God of his praise. Oh, yeah. All praise is to be toward him. You know, it's awful easy to give praise to man. It awful, it's awful easy. It's awful easy to brag about the accomplishments of, of an individual or a group. It could be a, a preacher. It could be a quartet, a trio. It could be a choir. It could be a church that's, had, a church that's really on fire. It, it's awful easy to brag when you see things are happening and people are involved. And I'm not, I'm not opposed to an applause or, or whatever it may be, but n never should we do anything for the idea of an applause or a pat on the back. Now, here's why. Because we're saved by grace. We're kept saved by grace. Everything that we are able to do is by the grace of God. Amen? And so he deserves, it is, listen, it's through his power and through his name that we are to get, able to do anything to get done. Any, I don't care what it is. 
Sunday school teacher teaching a class of little boys and girls or teenagers or the adult class. Well, we got a great Sunday school teacher. My kids have a great Sunday school teacher, and, and that's wonderful. But Sunday school teacher, no matter who you are, listen, don't ever let it get to your head that you're that great because it's him. It's him. Sometimes preachers get to the idea because their church gets big and big and big or the evangelist, the crowd gets big and big and big pretty soon they become, they become the, the, the head of it instead of Jesus. You know what? Listen, success can give you the big head. And success, can, and success has brought a many a person down because they couldn't handle it. And so you can rob God of his, of, of his praise. I wrote this down. Can Tiger Woods five iron brag? Who's Tiger Woods? He's a great golfer. Huh? Can Michael Jordan's basketball brag? Of course not. Hmm. Can Shakespeare's pen brag? Nolan Ryan's baseball, uh, uh, fast, uh, fast uh, uh, baseball. Can Babe Ruth's bat brag? Can the hunter's rifle brag? Hmm. Mayo Clinic's named after Dr. Mayo. Can his stethoscope brag? Get it? <clears throat> Can Longfellow's quill brag? Can the harp, uh, carpenter's hammer brag? No. It's the genius behind that. Can I say to you, all the genius behind everything we're able to get, the genius behind it, it's Jesus. We can brag about Miss Betty and Sister Ruth and their piano playing. But the one behind it is Jesus. Amen. We can brag about Denny's singing. We can brag about, and we can just add on and on. But I'm telling you, the genius, the power, the one behind it is the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember the first time I heard uh, Ray Hart sing, great soloist and he was he trained to be an opera singer and got saved and gave his talent to God and said he he would never he would only sing he would only sing for the Lord he would never sing any more of the secular music his mom and dad sort of turned on him but later they got saved and but uh, I remember uh, the first time we were sitting up close toward the front and which was rare uh, but we uh, sitting up close to the front and Doctor and Brother Ray Hart and uh, uh, he was introduced and but he got up and I'm telling you what a voice. What a voice. And though he sang with, with perfection as he sang, even though, even though the, the, uh, every note was perfect, every, everything was perfect, the one thing that captured my, my, my eyesight was not my, what I was hearing, but what I was seeing. As he sang, Ship Ahoy, tears run down his face and dripped off his chin. It's no wonder that when he's saying, boy, there was just a holy hush come over three or four thousand people because his singing was touched by the master of his voice. Wow. So when you don't praise God, praise God in everything you do. As you wash dishes, praise God. As you wash your automobile or cut your grass or, or trim your hedges or make your bed, do all to the glory of God. You know what the Bible says? Whatsoever you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. What that means is no matter what you do, give God the praise and the glory in it. This is just a, a small country church out in the country, but you know what? God has blessed this little place. Amen. God's hand's been on this little place, and we ought to never, ever forget who's the genius behind it. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's lift up our hands to him and say, glory to God. What a Savior we got. Let's forever tell the story of a redeeming Savior. And so don't rob God of his praise. Nobody deserves any more. He deserves every ounce of praise we could give him. We don't give him enough. When's the last time you praised God at home? <laughs> When's the last time you praised God for just <laughs> the shoes you got on? Praise him. Learn to praise him. He ain't going to hurt you. Not going to hurt you a bit. 
other day, Miss Baker was sitting in there doing something on her computer, and I heard her in there, and she was just, she was just, whoa, that's good, that's good. I went in and I said, what is going on in here? She said, you should have heard that. I said, play it again. And she played it again, and next thing you know, I'm in there shouting. I like that, amen? And so that's good stuff there. I don't know any of all that other stuff on there, but that was good stuff. Now listen to this. All that we're able to accomplish is because of Jesus. All that you have is because of him. Number four, oh boy, listen to this. You can rob God of his day. Now, say what you want, call me what you want. When I say you can rob God of his day, what do you mean, Brother Baker? The Lord's day. Remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. There was a day in America where Sunday was the Lord's day. There was a day in America where churches were, were practically full on Sunday, morning and Sunday evening and on Wednesday. There was a day, listen, there was a day in America to where no, nothing happened on Wednesday night because churches had prayer meeting. There was a day that where there were very few businesses open on Sunday. If they were, it was in between the Sunday morning and Sunday evening service just for a little bit. There was a day in America where even lost people, folks who were not even saved, honored the Lord's day. I remember my mother telling me this about my father. My, my father was, a, was an alcoholic. He drank all weekend. My mom said one time, said, uh, uh, your daddy got up on a Sunday morning and, and he had been drinking. He got up and, and it had been raining on. I'd washed the clothes and hung them out on the clothesline. You know what a clothesline is? <laughs> okay. Mama had hung the clothes out on Saturday, Brother Victor, on the clothesline in the backyard. And when daddy got up on Sunday morning and saw those clothes hanging on the line, even though it's raining, he said, you get out there and get them clothes off. The it's Sunday. We're not hanging clothes out on Sunday. That's what my drunken daddy said to my mama. We are robbing God of his day, the Lord's day. Now, if you want to get mathematical, we don't know which day of the week's the Sabbath day now because the calendar has changed a thousand times over the last 4,000 years. But God expects us to give him a day. And since we have set aside this day, as the Lord's day, the first day of the week, the resurrection day, what better day could we honor him than this day? Here's the sad testimony is, churches are calling off service. They're, and and, and I, can you imagine how heartbroken the Savior is when he looks down on, on this day that should be given to the preaching of his word and the edification of his word and God's people getting together and assembling together as we're told there in the book of Hebrews uh, the much more as we see the day approaching. And yet now the Lord's day has become a holiday instead of a holy day. It's become a day to where it's just a normal day to anybody and church is the least on people's minds today. And if they go, they want to go at their convenience. There are some churches now, so listen, we're going to have an early service so you can come and get out real quick and your day's done. Here's the point I'm making. The average Christian day, the average is not committed to God at all. They're committed to the pleasures of this world. My wife showed me a little something on her computer. She said, I want you to look at this. And it's a great message there. It showed, it showed a, a, a racetrack, NASCAR racetrack. 150,000 people. It showed a... a, a uh, college game on Saturday and it showed a pro game on Sunday. It showed it showed different athletic events on Sunday. The place is packed out and it showed the church empty. Oh. I think the saddest testimony could ever be said is 
here's a, here's a mom and daddy got, say, some children. And they, they love those children, so they're going to raise them up in church. So they get them in Sunday school, and the kids love Sunday school. They hear the they little kids, you know, they, they're singing, Jesus loves me, this, that. And they sing it, what's exciting, and then they start growing up. And they, they get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. And, and about, about 10, 11 years old, that little girl, that little boy becomes athletically inclined. Oh, yeah. Why, that little darling that used to dress like a little lady and, and wore their dresses and look like a little, now she's dressing like a boy. She's on the baseball team or the softball team. And they, they got to play on the weekends or the soccer team. Where well, it used to be, and the little boy, he's, he's a good football player, baseball player, whatever it may be. They used to get up and here, here's what it used to be like. All right, all right, kids, get up now. We got to get to Sunday school. We got to eat breakfast and, and we got to get to Sunday school. Don't want to miss church. And they're active in church and the kids are active in church. But time goes by. Now those kids are, are in the world. And now the parents go, all right, get up now. Get your uniform on. We don't want to be late for the game. And that little boy and that little girl that used to be training and now it's, the coach is more important now to that little boy and girl than the Sunday school teacher and their preacher. The coach is a the coach is a just a coach. And that little boy will girl will grow up, grow up knowing nothing about that Bible except the little Bible stories they got when they were little kids. And when they get married, when they grow up, they'll never go to church again. And they'll raise their, their that, you see, generations either get closer to God or further away. Which way you think they're going to go? Which way you think those grandkids are going to go? Wow. I'm telling you, the Bible says, in the last days, there'll be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Now, I'm not against athletics. Oh, no, 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 no. I think every father ought to teach his son to throw a baseball and hit a ball. Amen? I think a father ought to sit down and take his boy fishing, show him how to tie a knot, how to, how to cast. I think a father ought to sit down and do everything he can for that little boy to be, to be uh, uh, somewhat athletic, to be coordinated in any way, okay? Hit a nail with a hammer. Use a, use a drill. But I'm telling you, a father who puts that above the things of God is not a good father. He might think he is, but he's not. And a mother should make sure that little girl is taught to be feminine. Yeah. Be in the house of God on Sunday. Hurry up now, hurry up now. We got to get ready. We got, we got... Three games today. I, I got to have you at field B. I got to have him at field C and on and on. I'm telling you, you know, why, you know why churches are having to do things to get the young folks to come? It's because the young folks are attracted to the pleasures of this world. And so the church says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have our own tournament here. And rob God of his place. The church. Well, my heart goes out to moms and dads who have kids who get caught up in that. If they ever get a taste for it, whoo, oh boy, ever get a taste for it. Well, you want to see my little girl slide into second base. She knows how to slide. Isn't that something? My little girl sliding into second base. Let's go to the last one, okay, and we'll be through. And uh, this is something that I thought about before I wrote it down. You can rob God of your of your youth. Well, I'm not youth anymore. I'm, <laughs> my youth are behind me. So I want to put this in here for you young folks, okay? God wants the best years of your life. Will you agree with that? God does not want your leftovers in no capacity. He didn't want your leftover money. He didn't want your leftover service. And by no means am I saying that God doesn't want older people or middle-aged people. My point is this. A lot of young people have the idea, well, I will settle down with God in the church when I get older. That won't happen. 
Very seldom does that happen. God, don't rob God of your youth. Let God have your young years. Let God get involved in your life as a young as a young lady, a young man, as nine and ten years old, as a teenager in your early. Let give God the opportunity to get in your life, and you honor God as a young person. I've been asked this many times. What could, if you could change your life? What would you change? I would change one thing. If I could, I would change. I would love to have gotten saved sooner. Sooner than the age of 19. I don't know when I say that. I don't know if I'd have been a good Christian. I might have been like a lot of folks who said I might have got worldly too. I don't know. But I would hope that if I'd got saved sooner, I'd have could have done something in my youth for the Lord. Give God your young years. Get saved and live for God as a, a little boy and a little girl. Uh, sing and participate in church and go to youth activities and, and be involved in the things of God. Uh, moms and dads, get your kids involved. I'm going to tell you something. The devil's out there have a little boy and girl. Wow. Don't forget your youth. God wants all your years, old years, middle age. He wants all of them. But Brother Thomas, like you said this morning, you and, hey, we're looking back now. When I came here, I was when I came here, I was 27 years old, Victor. 27. Now, now sometimes I feel like I'm 127. I look over here and, and I, I see I see three generations sitting here. Three! Boy, that'll age you real quick. So I'm looking back. And I, I, I'm so glad as I look back on my, on my life as a Christian, I can say it wasn't wasted. I've, I've tried to give God the best years of my life, and I want to give him the rest years of my life too. I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, uh, walk out of here saying, you know, and grumble about living with God. I, hey, if, if I'm able to grunt for God, I want to grunt for him. Amen? <laughs> it's sort of like, it's sort of like uh, some of the older preachers that I, that I grew up being my heroes, I think I'm headed in their direction. I, I was talking to some other day, one of my favorite preachers, 77 years old. He's still preaching. Then I met a fellow who was 81. Oh, boy. Then Lee Robinson was 95 and still driving to revivals. 95. My wife said, that'll never happen to you. I said, why? She said, you can't hardly drive now. Much less 95. Oh, my soul. Will a man rob God? You can rob God of the tithes and offerings. You can rob God of his service that you owe him, of his praise. You put it on yourself or other people. You can rob God of his day by just laying out of church, and then you can rob God of your youth and of your time as an older person. Don't rob God at all. Give him everything. Give him him. Love him with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Honor him with everything you got. He says, prove me. And when you prove him, he'll always, he'll always back what he said. I will open up the windows of heaven and I will bless you. Amen. Let's pray. Now, Holy Spirit, would you please take what I've preached tonight, drive it into the hearts of those who are here. Lord, I... Oh, my. Give us some folks who put you to the test and see that you mean what you say, that you will open up the windows of heaven and you will pour out blessing that they, it'll, be, it'll be too much. They can't handle it all. Lord, I pray you'd give mamas and daddies great wisdom in raising their children. I pray, God, that we would never get to a point to where we would think we're, we've arrived and, and we could pat ourselves on the back but we always realize that we are just instruments in your hands. We're only able to do that which you have enabled us to do. And you deserve all the glory and all the praise. So, Lord, please bless the invitation. Now, we need, we need, we need church people, saved people. You'll get in the service of the kingdom, living for God day in and day out. With what time we have left, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Mind the Lord tonight now. Mind God. Times are running out. Young people, listen to Brother Baker. 
You're going to inherit this, this church one day. When I say inherit it, you young folks are here. Don't get caught up in the things of the world. Please don't. Honor God now. Honor Him now. Honor Him with what you have. Possessionally. Honor Him with your time, your talents. Give Him the praise and all that, that is able you're able to do. Mm. Glorify Him. We are His workmanship. He's working on us. We need to be busy. Busy, busy, busy. Parents, sit down with your children. Teach them some things. Teach them about this tithing business. Teach them what a tenth is. Teach them about spiritual things. Teach your son and daughter about integrity, keeping your word, living for God. Live it in front of them. Never, never, never should you put your child into something that's going to get them out of church and keep them out of church. That's never the will of God. Never. Amen. Well, it's been a good day, hasn't it? I tell you what, I tell you, I, I just I enjoy coming to church. Sometimes when I at the house, I don't feel like coming, but once I get here, I'm okay. You feel that way too sometimes. You get me so I hope Brother Baker don't preach too long tonight. When you come, and I do preach too long. One of these days, don't be like Brother Tommy. One time he missed, he missed a Sunday morning service, and I got out. I, we were walking out the door five till twelve. I don't. I think he, and somebody called Tommy, and said Tommy. Tommy said, well, yeah. So we're out in the parking lot of the church. He said, Brother Baker didn't preach, did he? He said, yes, he did, but we're out early. Tommy said, and I missed it. So I have done that, Brother Tommy. And I did it on purpose, too, so he, would get, he wouldn't be here. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. Oh, you're such a good congregation. I sure love you, and I believe you love each other. Let's pray and be dismissed. Father, thank you now for this day you've given us. What a wonderful day it's been. When I look at this crowd tonight, Lord, and see the many that are here, and I realize there's churches all over this county, all over this country, who've closed up their church doors. And some remain open with just a handful of people where it used to be, Lord, a good crowd there. So, Lord, I give you all the honor. I give you all the glory in what you've done here at this church. And I pray, God, you would, you would give us great wisdom as we go forward in the days of head to, Lord, to witness to those who need to be saved, invite folks to church so I see more people get saved in the days in which we live. We know the time is short, a lot to do, not many involved in it. Lord, let's all get involved. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.